And we're recording, by the way. Yep. Just so we know it's being recorded. Hang on, I've got a wee note here. What does it tell me what to do? do, do oh, yeah. Everyone's here now. Yeah, right, that's good. Um, so welcome, everybody. Just to reconvene this meeting of the hearings panel. This is our third hearing for today. Um, we're now moving on to agenda item number 20.6.4 which is an application for resource consent RC190506 McLaren Family Trust, Patterson Road, Bannockburn. And go to my next bit of paper. Just to confirm, this is a properly convened meeting of the hearings panel, called for the purpose of hearing submissions in relation to a resource application to... The right word, I want to turn the page. Uh, to consider an application for a subdivision to create two lots and for land use consent for residential activity on a lot which breaches yard standards. I'd ask the Minute Secretary to report on proceedings to date, please. All statutory requirements under Section 95 of the Resource Management Act have been complied with. The Court of Planning Consultants has been circulated to address the service. The submissions received have been identified in the report. Thank you, uh, Sue. Uh, the following procedure will be followed for the hearing. The panel or the officers may ask questions. Um, Council's officers or its consultants shall put any questions through the chair and the chair shall be deemed to be the person asking the questions. The applicant or the applicant's representative shall make submissions and present evidence. The submitters or their representatives shall then make submissions and present evidence. The applicant shall have the right of reply but shall not be permitted to again traverse new evidence, the evidence or nor raise new evidence. Um, so before proceeding, I'd ask that all the parties identify themselves. And just to make that easier, can I take it that Peter Dummett, you're here um, appearing um, with the applicants, Mr. and Mrs. McLaren, and Mark Christie, you are here as a submitter. Is that summed it up pretty well? That yes, is correct. correct. Cool. Thank you. Um, and so just for the record, um, obviously technology will be challenging. Um, if you can, and it's easy to mute when you're not talking, that will be good. Um, Mr. and Mrs. McLaren, don't touch nothing. <laughs> good. Good. <laughs> Um, sorry, I just mean to be unkind by saying that, but uh, <laughs> it's very wise. <laughs> yeah, um, and um, we just need to probably watch with our videos um, for the rest of us that it doesn't cause any bandwidth issues. It, it probably won't, shouldn't be an issue, but we'll just try and see how that works. Um, now, I know. Um, I don't know the applicant particularly well, but I do know Mr. Christie quite well. I haven't seen him for quite some time, but I should just make sure that people know that that, that I do know that. Um, Stephen, I probably think you know Mr. McLaren quite well, mm -hmm. and I would imagine that no one's no one's unhappy about those relationships we might have with the people that are party to this um, hearing today. Good. <clears throat> um, we'll hand over to the applicant. Are you going to lead that off? Um, oh, sorry. First of all, um, I'll ask for one of the um, panel members to move the report plans. The report of the planning planning officer be taken as read. I'll move that, Chairman. Second. And all in favour, aye. So that's moved. Stephen, seconded. Martin and carried. Um, um, Peter, will we pass over to you to lead the charge? Is that the way you want to take it? Yeah, that's the way we want to take it. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Over to you then. Okay. Um, my written submissions should have been pre-circulated. Has everyone got a copy of them? Yes. Uh, also, the written submissions of uh, Jill and John McLaren. Yep. yep. Pre and also the submission, written submissions of um, the submitter, the Mr. Um, Christie. Yep. Yep. We have all those documents in front of us. Oh yeah, we also sent through a extract from the o o ODT a couple of weeks ago about um, Mr. and Mrs. McLaren's uh, arboretum. Everyone yep. got that as well. Yep. Other thing I sent through was an A3 copy, colour copy of the plan of subdivision, which I've got up on another screen here in front of me. But has everyone got access to that as well? The answer to that is yes. Now, hang on, just to clarify, that was the one that was attached to your evidence. Yeah. Okay, all good. And everyone had a look at the site and pretty familiar with it, right? Yep. Good one. Well, um, I'm not going to go through word for word in my submissions. I can take it as read. Is that okay? Yep, that's fine. Uh, Peter, I just do highlight. Yep. highlight the bits you need to highlight. Sure. Um, well, there's no change to the application as made. Um, so we'll just run through the highlights here of my 
written submission. Um, I won't go through all what, what it's all about in any great detail. It's uh, subdividing off a small lot around a arboretum, and that includes a resource consent for a, a dwelling inside that small 0.6 hectare lot. The balance of the site, 7.6 hectares, will be retained by the McLarens, and the um, lot two will be um, sold to their daughter. Uh, so, going through my submission and talking the highlights, uh, affected party approvals. We've got the written affected party approvals of all the owners, okay, all, all the people around, everyone has supplied their written affected party approval. So therefore, we can't consider any adverse effects on those. The application was publicly um, notified and we had uh, one, two, three, four, four submissions in support, two of which emphasise the importance of the arboretum. So turning now to the Plan of the Section 42A report, which you are aware recommends that this application be turned down. We'll dispute that. Um, the first, I guess the issues that he's got, are the utilisation of the productive soil resource. These are the issues that are highlighted. Reverse sensitivity, adverse landscape and rural amenity effects, and the setting of an undesirable precedent. So we'll just, I'll just run through those Briefly, um, the McLarens and, the, and Mr. Christie will also be enlarging on some aspects of these. So talking about um, the fragmentation of the rural land resource and the um, of the soil resource, I, when you look at this site, it's really more part of the leaning, uh, the pigeon rock de development, which is, as you're all aware, there's a whole series of high-level lots on these brown, steep, rocky, very steep faces of the lower Kemua range. There's only a very small part of this particular site that's got any productive potential, and most of that's inside the lot too in any case. So we don't think there's going to be any adverse effect on the productive utilisation of the productive soil resource by this subdivision. Um, it's just That's just not true. It's just basically almost all of the site is like bare, rocky, sort of native grass and shrubbery ground. All the good land has been subdivided off in front of it and established. In um, there's vineyards and there's an orchard right next door, the Poland, uh, uh, the Poland orchard. The other three lots on the western and southern boundary are pure lifestyle blocks. That's all they're used for. There's no way they have any productive potential. Once again, bare, rocky, time-covered, weed-infested ground. It's just not productive land. So we have lifestyle blocks on three sides, or actually the west, the south, and the east, and on the north there's a productive orchard. So that then raises the issue of um, reverse sensitivity and then which is, can only be with the productive orchard. The rest of the surrounding land is just lifestyle blocks. There won't be any reverse sensitivity issues. What's happened there is that there's been a private land covenant negotiated with the Paulins, which was a condition of them supplying their affected party approval. This is becoming quite a common thing, which prevents either lots one or two having any complaints at all about the operation of their orchard. These are very common becoming much more common and they're very effective. So, and I don't agree with your reporting planner that uh, these uh, restrictive covenants are not effective. I don't agree with that at all. That they're very common and they're extremely effective. Right, the retention of the genetic resource within lot two will be dealt with further by Mr. McLaren and his submission, Mr. and Mrs. McLaren. Um, I'll deal with that in some more detail as to, as to how that's been done. Right. Uh, also, your reporting plan is talking about um, 
not being, these people next door not being able to have wind machines on their land because they'll be within a hundred meters of the um, of, of of a new dwelling on lot two. You draw in a circle a um, hundred meters around. So if you have a look at your planning uh, his planning report, you'll see there's a little plan in there with a circle a hundred meters around the existing house. First thing you're going to notice is that most of the circle is actually on lot one and the adjoining lot nine. GP405466 and lot two, which are both lifestyle blocks. I have no intention whatever of ever putting a wind machine on there. And as far as the orchard's concerned, well, they have the no complaints uh, thing for a start. And also, there's only a tiny sliver of land where there's no way you put a, a wind machine there. If you ever put a, a frost fan there, it's going to be in the middle of the block. It's not going to be right on the corner there. It's totally inefficient, not cost effective. There's no way. Someone would ever put a fox in there. So I really don't believe that uh, this subdivision is going to have any adverse effect on the utilisation of the productive rural land resource either within the site or any of the surrounding sites. It's not going to restrict the surrounding people in any way, whatever. Right. Um, his opinion about it. The reasons behind the subdivision being disingenuous, I think we strongly submit <laughs> we get that. And Mr. and Mrs. McLaren are going to be further dealing with that issue. He doesn't believe that the subdivision uh, basically in any way protects the arbitrary, but that's, 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 that's just not true. And in terms of precedent, which is another little thing, they're saying, well, I've been in practice here for 30 years and I've never ever come across this particular set of circumstances ever before. So in my view, it does represent a pretty unique reason for this subdivision that could not be replicated anywhere else. I'm not aware of any other arboretum anywhere else in Central Otago that this current set of circumstances. So my take on it is, well, if this is an exceptional circumstances, well then what is? I mean, I, I can't for the life of me understand the standard reason behind that. Then we go into section 104D of the RMA, which is your threshold test, which says that basically you the effects have got to be minor or they're not um, contrary to the overall objectives and policies of the plan. Otherwise you can't consider it. So in my view it passes both of those limbs. A the effects are minor. And B, the case law tells us that we've got to look not just at the rules and the plans, you've got to look at the overall cast and intent of the plan and the fact that there's always an option for an exemption exception through the non compliant process. Uh, and contrary just doesn't mean it doesn't find support in the rules and objectives. It's got to be totally repugnant to or opposed to. And in my view, this application is not totally repugnant or opposed to the overall cast of the plan in terms of its policies and objectives. And this is a true exception. It won't be re replicated. So by agreeing to the subdivision, you're not creating any sort of adverse pre precedent effect, which will adversely impact on the consistent administration of the district plan. And and dealing with the proposed conditions are all satisfactory, acceptable, as expected. Um, the city concerns is standard stuff, which we would expect in any subdivision. Uh, so we're totally happy with those. If you see fit to um, approve the subdivision. So just to sum up, um, it's not contrary to the objectives and policies of either the district plan or the regional plan. It doesn't have an adverse effect on rural amenity and the rural landscape. If you look at the other argument that your planner has agreed that the house itself is going to have a very limited impact in terms of visibility from the general public and from the other sites. I have to point out once again that all the owners have given their affected party approval, so therefore you can't consider any adverse effect on them whatever, including reverse sensitivity effects of all given their written affected party approval, so they're not affected in any way. Well, they could be affected, but you can't take that into account. Um, 
So um, it will not have any reverse sensitivity. It doesn't adversely affect the utilization of the district's productive soil resource. It is generally compatible with its receiving environment. There's a total mixture of um, in that particular part in the Kemuel Inlet. There's houses everywhere in amongst the vines. There's also pure lifestyle blocks. And in, the, in above, in the hills behind, there's this huge band of totally quite large lots between 8 and 20 hectares, but they're totally used for um, lifestyle purposes. There's no productive use, whatever, made of them, and, and can't be. So it's quite compatible with that receiving environment. Um, and it's a unique exception to the general run of such applications, such that a significant adverse precedent effect will not be created. So in summary, um, we believe that it complies with all of the requirements of the district plan if, when you consider the planet as a whole. And um, accordingly, on behalf of the applicant, I ask that you approve the application subject to the proposed conditions. And I'll now hand you over, perhaps it would be better for you to hear the whole picture. So I'll hand you over to John and Jill before you want to ask any questions, if that's okay. Yeah, thanks, um, Mr. Dimmick. I think that's a good idea to hear um, from everybody and then just do all the questions at once um, because I think there'll be some overlap. Clearly, I know some of the questions I've got will overlap both you and the applicants. So, um, Mr. McLaren, um, your opportunity um, to speak to your submission, which um, we have all got, um, it has been pre circulated, um, and you can take it that we have read it. Um, so, I guess, much like Mr. Dimmick just said, if you want to maybe highlight the key points to us, that'll be fine. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I would, the introduction is uh, mainly to do with uh, the uh, first paragraph, just to do with the number of issues and objections raised by the CRDC's senior planning officer, Holly McIntosh, um, in, <coughs> in relation to the requirements in the district plan to minimise the effect of uh, development of houses on the landscape. Point 26, I guess that's. Um, the first point I'd like to make is the position of the new house within lot two. Was, as, as Peter's mentioned, it was reached in consultation with the neighbours. And uh, none of them will be able to see the new house from their homes. And they will all have submitted approvals. Uh, secondly, the house would position much lower on the hill on poor soil and, and will not show on the skyline, which you know, I think the council uh, will approve as well. And not be visible from any distance because the house site is low on the hill and screened by trees, which are still growing much, much bigger every year. And don't, we don't intend to take them down. Um, sorry, we can put a picture up of the, of the, whole, the site. whole site. I don't know whether you can see it there. That's our yep. house there. We go across here to the other part and probably see the Peaks edge, I can't see, but you'll have to hold it pointed out there, I think. And um, <laughs> the actual, these are poles for the house side. Yeah, you can see the, the hillside at the back is just nothing but scab weed and rocks and time. We can never do anything with that. So our, house. our house is here. There are two houses further up the hill and three on parallel with our boundary up here. Yes, you can see the houses there. So you get the picture, that's the house site lower down here. Yeah, yeah. Hey. Come up. Yeah. And that's another view there of the houses. On yeah, the... yeah, don't, no, no, don't yeah. read it. Right. Okay. <laughs> Right, point 29 refers to land use conflicts in relation to adverse environmental conflicts. Well, Peter's mentioned this to start with. But, um, the, the proposed use of the land in proposed uh, lot two will not change and has minimal environmental impact. And frost flooding, if it's needed, we, we're pretty well frost free on these slopes. We've only frost flooded apricots, I think, once in their lifetime, and we've had a crop every for 10 years. So they're Apricots are pretty sensitive to frost, as, as, as you all know. Stephen knows all about that. Um, so we have overhead sprinklers, but we never use them. Um, frost fans, no, that, that's all been mentioned by Peter, and I think that we 
When we spray, we use a small sprayer we pull behind the, the, the mower, which is very small. It's a hand garden, it's only large spraying, which would affect neighbours. Um, and we do endorse uh, CRD's um, efforts to protect product of land, but if the hearing could see our site, we'd we'll be able to verify that we have been able to utilise just small pockets of land and the changing contours or steepness in site uh, in general make it impossible to develop anymore. Point 30 is irrelevant in this case because there is no or little productive land on lots one or two. These, uh, those patches have been developed and the soil has been improved to be both biologically active and carbon sequestering, producing a range of plants which will replace the scab we can find, which was previously mentioned by Peter. Subdivision. And subdivision would not reduce the productive areas and the new house would not be in one of these productive patches. Uh, in the picture below, our house is on the very left. Of the, we won't show that. Yep. Just, it's right yep. to that one. Um, and the point 32 raises the issue of fragmentation of the real landscape. This issue has been raised too late, as Peter's mentioned about the yeah, too late, yeah. late marvellous. The Kim area is now considered a considerable number of houses on small lifestyle uh, lots all around, with five houses already existing on the southern boundary. And point 28 raises the question about the long term protection of the arboretum. I won't say how long a piece of string, but we, our intention is to try and uh, work out a succession planning for Neva Fruit Company. And we have to do this because we have an overseas partner that we've worked with for many years. And, uh, we can get some support, but we need to work out how our daughter, Jennifer, and her little girl, she's a solo mum, but she's very keen to, to carry on if we have to shift through either health or we run out of steam or energy or whatever you do when you get to our age. Um, <laughs> <laughs> much of the plant material in the arboretum is already protected by the plant patents or what we call um, trademarks. Um, and and uh, some ornamentals we have as well. We're not we're delving into other sides of plant breeding, and we have a flamingo, um, uh, which is a crab apple, which we've developed, and the apples, um, Sonia, which now has become international. He's looking forward to each year to getting the Sonia apple, which was developed by us many years ago. Uh, we originally went to the Apple and Pear Board, and they weren't interested. And this shows the difficulties of. of uh, you can hold that up. Yep, no, I can show them that. This, yes, this that came the, through on Thursday. This came from Thursday from China. And you can see that the Chinese absolutely love Sonia. It's for their premium apple now. They're can really you move that towards your wife, please? Yeah, this way. This way? How's that? You can probably read the headline. It's just the headline. Does it make sense? Further back. Hold it further back. You hold it for, just hold it further back. Yep. Better. Cool. Yep. Thank you. And yep. that's been run by our next um, sampler tiger gentleman, Greg, Greg Taylor. He runs Fishco, and he's the one that is, um, has has really developed Sony into a good international apple. They tried it. They tried it in America, and it got sunburned, so they didn't do grow it anymore. So we don't want to get it sunburned. But uh, that's okay. That's just history. And uh, so the, the protection is a big job and it does cost, but you've got to do it if you're going to, to um, produce valuable material for the New Zealand market and overseas. And having a house in front of the planting will better protect the planting from any possible theft. And that's what you have to think of nowadays, that people don't just flog um, drugs, they do flog plants and the stew and they end up in strange countries. Um, so our daughter Jennifer is currently employed by the Nevis company and she's undergoing training to help look after the arboretum um, when we fit. So she's, she's Just hold it there. Hold it there. Yeah. That's our daughter and she, her, her daughter. daughter. Her daughter. So she's a solo mum and I guess that she's pretty keen to, to carry on if we get into trouble. And um, we just particularly hope that she'll be able to keep the 100 odd apple selections growing here because we're still trying to evaluate them on lot, this new lot that we want to subdivide. Um, it could be five or ten years before we get another variety. It's, it's pretty, um, Stephen, you probably know how difficult it is to get new varieties established. It's got to go through the 
testing period and, and the growers have got to be satisfied with it and they can sell it. So it, it's, it's quite a business. So it, it's an important source of propagating material when you have them on the place. And uh, the trees of the new selection chosen for commercial production will need to be retained in a dedicated planting, in which case this would be what we're doing with Sonia on this patch now that we want to subdivide. We've got different strains of red Sonia, which are extremely valuable because the next plantings will be red Sonia because when they developed gala, they had gala for a number of years and then everybody wanted a colour apple, so they got a raw gala, a red gala. So we, we've got these growing on this flock now and they need to be protected. It may take four or five years to, to that's one of the trees there. That's the source of budwood. That's one of the sources of Sonia. Mm -hmm. You see how red that is, it's the sport of Sonia. So the plant material is then supplied <coughs> from these um, trees that have been authentically um, uh, assessed and stability of the selection is good. Um, sometimes you get reversion, you get change of back to the, the standard one. We don't want that if we can help it. Um, so the registered plant nurseries will then propagate them by budding and grafting. It's true to type, it's not subject to reversion, uh, to, <coughs> particularly if the fruit's coloured um, as you get in sports. Um, the subdivision will make it possible to retain and test these apples. Um, further, especially since some of the trees are just cropping for the first time this year, having been planted in the spring 2018. Given the size and importance of the apple industry in both New Zealand and globally, it needs to be understood that the launching of a new variety is a very slow process and involving big decisions by a number of fruit growers and export companies. And nobody can predict the long term success of any apple, but um, we do expect worthwhile progress to be made within the tenure period of the McLaren. So long as this subdivision is allowed to happen, rest assured there are some very good apples there. We'd love the members of the panel to be able to sample them for themselves and see the range of, of types that we've got in storage at the moment. It was a bit late because of the uh, virus thing. We couldn't see them on the trees, but uh, it would be nice to have everybody out. In 1918, the Nevis Fruit Company was, was granted a Callaghan Research and Development Project grant to test most of the promising apple varieties, selections in commercial orchards in both Hawke's Bay and Central Otago. They were planted into these districts in spring 1919, 2019, with trees sourced from existing planters we have at our 30, uh, 53 Patterson Road. And then a bit of the history is that in 2009, the major block of land growing from the original, <coughs> original approximately 25,000 seedlings of apples in the Nevis program was divided, subdivided, and most of the apple and apricot trees were removed. At that time, but of all the most promising apple selections were sent to Wyoming Nurseries in Nelson, and one or two trees of these was returned to our place in 2011. These are growing on lot one at present. The older selections are on our existing place. The remainder of the 100 old selections were returned in 2018 and were planted in a proposed lot to hence the sense of unfinished business and the need to secure the future of these trees by allowing, allowing the subdivision to occur and be able to manage the trees through to their final stages. Mentioned meant of an art studio and I think from his uh, return of it, this is a relocatable building which is used by an office for um, Nevis Fruit Company and, and also at our old place at Dunstan Road. And uh, once Clyde Orchards, we just got rid of the orchard there, we shifted on to this place and it's now in the current spot. In 2000, um, it remains, it's still on block, so it'll be big time. And uh, that's about it. I think that's about all I can say at this stage. And um, uh, I'd like to read you this mention as, as the Wyoming nurseries are the very, the biggest tree nursery in the country and they grow thousands and hundreds of thousands of apple trees a year for, for people throughout the country. And they, these are many well export varieties. And um, Bruno Simpson's the CEO of Wyoming Nurseries in Melton. He, he sent um, yeah. a support. The Melton seemed to be coming through on the support. You read it. 
but I can assure we support the non-compliance subdivision of the land on the basis of preservation. We have an important apple breeding program, progeny, from the Deep and the identified subdivided lot. This subdivision would allow longer term preservation of up to 100 apple selections developed by the Mears Fruit Company Limited. The future evaluation and commercial potential. The NFC have proven success with the Sonia apple, and given the time it's taken to develop new varieties, it generally takes 15 to 20 years to select and commercialise an apple selection. So I'm not going to be around, am I? It is important that this material is preserved for observation. The introduction of overseas but new material is slow and at times not impossible uh, due to plant health requirements imposed by the Ministry of Prime Ministers. The MPI are running scared and they just have sort of made a block on everything that's uh, wants to come in. If you want to bring a variety in, it will cost you between forty and fifty thousand dollars for any one proven unproven variety. So you can see why the um, elevates the um, <coughs> potential importance of the program being preserved. The granting of this application will enable the preservation of the plantings on a smaller, and more manageable unit of land, which should ensure it is preserved for a considerable time. It is a problem because when we, I used to work for the DSI, we used to bring in hundreds of new varieties every year and it cost nothing. But since Douglas came in, we changed everything, it was user pays. And I guess um, it would cost you a heap now to get anything in. And a lot of people are just doing it unless the orchard is prepared to pay for it. So I guess that's um, a good time to get out of work, then, isn't it, Stephen? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. McLaren. Um, you be, we, we did get the um, submission from Waimea Nurseries. It is part of the um, information we've got before us, so it is, it is before us. Thank you. Um, thank you. That was very helpful. Can I just check one thing with a date? At point 10 of your evidence uh, submission, you talk about in 1918, the Nevis no, Company? 1919, Does that mean to be maybe 2018? Is that the Callaghan? Callaghan? Yeah. Yes, no, yeah, no mistake. It's, it's 19. <laughs> 1919. Yes, and it's written down in your copy. You just changed it to 19. Yeah. So is it 1919 or 2019? Oh, 2000. Oh, 2000. <laughs> <laughs> the 18-bit was a bit irrelevant, really. It was the 19 so that had to be coming in. <laughs> <laughs> so it was two, it's 2018 or 2019, then. That's all right. Yeah, <laughs> thank God for a good man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, so we will probably have some questions of both yourselves and Mr. Dimmick. So maybe if I'd start with with yourself first, Mr. McLaren. Um, can, in your um, submission, there's some good photographs, and I want to make sure I've got the right bearings with the houses that are in those two photographs. So can I take you to the first photograph? Which is just above point no, three. No, one in the seat there. Yes. Seen this one. Just above point three of your submission, and there's three houses yep. in there. Yep. Can you just identify whose house is whose, just to make sure I get my bearings right? The middle right. one is Christie's. Christie's is the middle one we're in at the moment. Right, that's what I thought. Yes. Grant, Grant Richards. Richards. Grant Richards below it. Yes. And David Olds up above. Olds probably here. Yeah. Right, and then on your other photograph, yes, yeah. we've got Warwick Hamilton, Warwick Hamilton just above us. I can't see that. So, so that's is that your house in the in the middle left? Yes. yes. Yep. Yep. Yes. Okay, hold it back. No. And the yes. top house, the top house is Hamilton. Yes, and yes. the one at the very top is Cooper. Cooper's. Right on the skyline. Yeah, it's coming up. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep. I think there's another one right up the top. Let's just see it. Hmm. Well, those photos are taking looking south, aren't they, basically? They're looking yes. south. Yes. Yeah, they are. Yes. Uh, Peter, yeah. From behind, that's correct. Yeah. So basically, lot 2, DP432300, and lot 6, DP432300, and lots higher than that. <laughs> the yep. south. Yes, much higher than us, and a more yeah, eminent. Yeah. I think we're one of the first ones here. Um, 
Yeah, it's quite it's quite deceptive just trying to look at a photo with the sort of the. It is. It is. You, so, you, and you say the angle doesn't look right. Something's deceiving about this, and I just wanted to make sure I had it in my head right because it's not how I construed it to look like when I'd seen it. No, no, it's just it's Good. deceiving. Yeah, it's, no, thank you. That's that's helpful. Um, so, so I guess my. The first question I've got is is really about the the arboretum and how it's proposed that that is protected going forward. Because I've heard from Mr. Dimmock and his evidence about the uniqueness of, of what you've got, and I understand that um, very very well. Um, I, I'm just um, looking for some certainty out of what is being proposed that that can be protected going into the future because that is I think if I picked it up right that's sort of the, the underlying reason for the subdivision is to protect the arboretum um, and but that your section size may not be as small and it might be a different um, proposition we're considering but um, what is it that you could tell me about your application that's going to protect that arboretum going forward? Having a daughter keen to look after it. Yes, I think so. But unless you put it into the um, what is it, the QE2 something, <laughs> that would probably tie it up for a long, for permanently. But uh, it, it may be uh, it's quite difficult to to work it out. But I think she's going to uh, make a good job. She's been working for me for a while. Um, it's interesting how you um, put down QE2 because in my note I put exactly that, a QE2 covenant or something like that to try and protect it. And it's not that I don't think for a moment that your daughter won't want to keep it going, but I, um, despite the best of intentions, sometimes things don't work out for a variety of reasons, of course. Um, and I'm just trying to say, well, you know, it, it would seem to me to be helpful if there was some way of providing that certainty going forward, because... Well, I think the council would be particularly interested in seeing this preserved. So I, you might have some suggestions as to how we could um, help us to do it. I mean, it's a district thing. It's a central Targo thing. It's a wealth creator. I know that. And, and yeah. uh, Stephen already knows how many apricots we've released throughout the district. Uh, and the late apricots have done a lot for central. Yep. And that's part of the Nevis program. So I guess if I was to leave it at this stage saying it, that should it should should the panel be of the view to to support the application and was to look at some sort of condition that's not currently there that yeah. provides some you know, the arboretum going forward, then you would not be averse to that. No, it uh, may be. That's great. Good yeah, suggestion. Good suggestion. Yeah. Mm. I don't know what I don't know what it would look like, and of course I'm not saying we're going to say yes or no, but I'm trying to get a feel for where we might end up and what we could do because I, I guess um, you know I can all the other issues that have been raised and worked through and Mr Dimmick has picked up um, there's always going to be a philosophical discussion from the district plan point of view and, and I respect oh, yeah. that um, and it's entirely appropriate but I think the key thing I'm picking up here is that this is this is significant enough to actually um, um, go outside what the plan would otherwise provide, and if it's that significant, then there may be one of the options we have is to find a way to to provide for its protection into the future. That would be good. Great. I would appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, and I'm not, not promising anything, but I'm just simply saying that that right. I'm sure Mr. Mr. Dimmock is sitting there now, going, "I wonder how I can give him what he's asking for." <laughs> he has a look on his face. I know. Um, I've seen it before. <laughs> QE2 trust is not an option because it's not a conservation sort of a thing, right? That's yes. natural. Yeah. There are other mechanisms that maybe there could be some sort of a trust set up uh, and it has a, a covenant over it. Um, what I'm suggesting uh, is that at the end of this hearing, that the hearing be um, postponed or I'm not. I suppose what's the word? Um, adjourned. Adjourned, and we could discuss this option further if you like. It's some sort of a, a covenant on the land. Um, in it would have to be in favour of other land is the only option, really. Um, so if you're of a mind to be agreeable to that, we could adjourn the yep. hearing at the end of the hearing and come up with some 
ideas, if you like, and present that better to the council. Yeah, let's let's just go through the um the um the, the other questions, Peter, and just park that. Um, <laughs> I, I think it was important to put that to Mr. and Mrs. McLaren at the end of the day because I think um I'm, I'm, I, the answer I got to my question was quite honestly what I expected. So I'm, I'm, that does give me some um some um satisfaction going forward. So maybe um, Peter, my questions now come more to you. Um, nothing too significant. Um, Uh, yeah, right. um, I just make the observation for what it's worth that, that at paragraph 20 of your evidence, Peter, um, about covenants and the experience relayed to me as a councillor and my personal experience about covenants is that, yes, you're 100% right, they're entirely effective as long as someone is prepared to take on the other party who's prepared to ignore them. And and often, and often that and, and 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 as you well know, the council then get put in the middle of that, and then have to say, well, it's nothing to do with us because we're not party to it, and that doesn't give anybody any satisfaction. Um, and I'm not suggesting for a moment um, that um, this would happen in this situation here at all, but um, that is the bitter experience of far too many people. And I'm sure you know as many of them as I do, um, and I think that the that the observation um, in the planning officer's report in that respect is in, entirely correct. Um, but just some people just make things awkward, and yeah, I'll leave it. I'll leave it at that. I think there's two comments here. What other mechanism is there? And the second thing is um, the orchard in particular has given its affected party approval. It can't yep. be in the best interest to be. You can't consider any effects on him. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm. I'm not. I'm not um, raising that as considering any effects on the affected parties because at the end of the day, they might move on, and then. Other parties do other things with the covenants, and that becomes the issue later on. It's just an observation, and, and, and that, that sort of make. there is a legal mechanism there. That's the only one that's there. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. So you've answered my question with that one there, and ah, oh, um, this is one that I that I, I see coming up more and more often is that lot one is going to be a reasonable large chunk of land going forward. Um, that are someone in the future who's not part of the McLaren family will own. That's right. um, and I can just see that that with a very um, competent planning assistant with them, that they could put a case for a further subdivision. Um, is that an issue you see going forward? Um, and would the applicant consider whether Lot 1 would have a covenant that stopped it from being re-subdivided going forward? My main comment is that it would be non-compliant. Yep. I mean, you can have a covenant to say that um, um, no further subdivision unless there's a change in the district plan, yep. uh, you know, but in this case, it's non-compliant. Yeah, but you know as well as I do, Mr. Dimmick, and because you're very good at doing applications for non-complying consent applications um, that have been granted, um, it's not, it's it's just a, I guess what I'm raising is, is, the, is a further um, hurdle for the future. Yes, I understand it's a little hurdle, and you can you can put these consent notices on, and they can be overcome, and we have overcome them. No yep. non-provision things. Um, during the adjournment, I'll discuss that further yep. with the applicant if, if 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 they would be happy with a no further subdivision on that lot. Okay. Yep. Cool. Thank you. That's all the questions that I have. Um, Martin, can I go to you first? No, I think um, the question I had was how you secure that site in, into the future, and you've covered it, it very well, Mr. Chairman. You've raised the um, the issue of a covenant as far as further subdivision on Lot 1, and how do you protect the arbor, Arboretum into the future? Um, and I wait with bated breath to see what the applicant comes back with. Well, I, I wait with bated breath to see what the planning officer says first. <laughs> well, yes, we'd have to take Ollie's um, experience into into, but I, you know, I think they're, they're, they're my two questions. Yeah, yeah. cool. Um, Stephen, I'm on a slightly different track. The genetic material that's currently there, and as far as privately held goes, that would probably be significant in New Zealand. Is that correct? Right, yeah. Internationally, internationally. So, so the, the follow-up question to that is: that, Is any of that 
genetic material being held by any nursery. So you use, talk about why mere, or have you, um, I guess that they've obviously been doing some grafting for you or propagating for you. And all, has all the material come back or is it some of it held yes, by nursery? Back to us. And the only one that they do have some are sources for the Sonia. They get their wood because it's been released yes. internationally. Yes. But the other hundred odd selections are all no, here. They're on this place. They're still here. Only, not in nurseries. They're in block uh, one, uh, one and two. They're not just all in one. But the last lot we got back are on one. Yes. Okay. Cool. okay. Thank you. Is that you done, Stephen? Yeah, you've um, covered the other side of it pretty well. So, yep. okay. Thank you. Sorry yeah. for that. Um, Ollie, are you there? Yes. I've got to the mute button. Okay. <laughs> Have you got any questions you'd like me to ask? Um, no direct questions, but would you yes. like me to go through my yep. points? Um, the panel I've taken my 42A report is red, so I won't. I, I, I still stand by the positions I outlined in that report, so I'll try to keep it brief, but I think there are a few points that have come up today that I'd like to address. Um, firstly, just in, by way of context, uh, what we're considering here is a non-compliant rural subdivision, but it's, it's, it's not a marginal non-compliant stretch. It's a subdivision that will effectively double the anticipated density, the eight hectare average standard, and it will also result in one lot, which is only 6,400 meters of their power. Can't understand. Way yeah, Ollie, can you just hold here? You're, um, you're breaking up, so. Okay. Yep. Is that better? We'll see how it goes. Let me know if, if, if that's not working well, then I'll take the headphones out. Um, Mr. And Mrs. McLaren and Mr. Mr. Dimmick have, have outlined the reasons for the application. Um, this is to, for their desire to, to, to make a place for their daughter to live and also to retain ownership over the arboretum. Um, and we've heard all about the, the importance of that arboretum. Um, it's my opinion that the arboretum is really the crux of this proposal. Um, and both per personally and professionally, I, I wholeheartedly agree that it is obviously an important resource and, and something I don't think any of us want to see go should there return to future generations. The problem I have is I'm, I'm still unconvinced that this subdivision is the appropriate mechanism to do that, um, or that it will be an, at all an effective mechanism to do that. Um, as I see it, the fact is there's, there's actually nothing in this proposal which places any protection over the arboretum, other than you know, it being retained uh, for the foreseeable future in, in the applicant's family. And although I don't doubt that's the applicant's sincere desire, the fact is that in a couple of years' time, and I think we've all seen this before, um, there's nothing to say that the ability circumstances won't change and suddenly she wants to move to the city or whatever the case may be, um, at which point, there's nothing stopping lot, this, this small lot from being sold um, and from the next owner coming along and cutting down the, the fruit trees. Or at least there's, there's no more protection stop that from happening than there is currently. Um, <clears throat> if they wanted to sell the property, the, the retire into town or whatever the case may be and retain control over that arboretum. My understanding is that there are other mechanisms, whether it be a lease type arrangement 
otherwise the, the lease is the obvious one that comes to my mind that would allow them to do this um you don't need to do a non-compliant subdivision to just continue the orchard operation as for their other motivation to provide a home for their daughter i get that I'm sure we can all relate to that um it's you know the fact is, unfortunately, that simply isn't a matter under the RMA that, that justifies a proposal such as this. Um, so that, that, that's all I have to say about that. that. There are a couple points, other points, that I'll just directly address. And Mr. Dimmick's evidence, just to say, refer to my report. Um, <coughs> Paragraph 13 of Mr. Dimmick's evidence refers to my assessment of the visual impacts of the development, where I've made some statements that appear to be contradictory. Um, on that point, I'd, I'd just simply point out that the open space, landscape, natural factor, and amenity values of the rural resource area are not wholly dependent on site's visual prominence. That is to say, just because a site such as this one isn't visually prominent, means that creating lot sizes of less than a hectare in area are, are in keeping with those open space landscape and amenity values of the rural zone, rural resource area. Um, and at paragraph 17, is the submission. Uh, asserts that despite the fact that the site does not have access to potential irrigation supply on parts of it has a relatively high GDD, the steepness of the terrain and poor soils over the great majority of the site mean that it doesn't have significant structural potential. And he goes on to point out that the McLaren's and Christie's have expertise in this matter that's past my own. And therefore their opinions should carry more weight in this regard. Um, I don't doubt at all that they do indeed have much greater horticultural expertise than myself, but I just clarify that my conclusion, what I'm saying is that by excising this area of highly productive land from the larger parcel that is otherwise limited productive capacity, my opinion that the subdivision will have an adverse effect on the site's productive capacity. I believe that's what I've written in my report. I also observe that although I'm not an expert in horticulture, I do have some expertise in resource management and I have got quite extensive experience applying this in rural settings. And it's been my observation in these settings that fragmentation of rural holdings generally results in issues of reverse productivity, reduced productivity, as well as a reduced opportunity for rural industries to adapt, change, and respond, whether that's to changes in markets or, or climate change or whatever. Someone's getting some serious feedback in their microphone there. I'm not sure if you guys are getting that. Um, paragraphs 24 and 25 of Mr. Dimmick's evidence. The Dimmick disputes my findings um, in regard to the matter of precedent, because in his opinion, the Arboretum sets this case apart from others. Uh, I, I feel like I've probably addressed this one already, but for the avoidance of doubt, I do consider the Arboretum to be a distinguishing feature of this site. However, I do not consider this proposal actually provides the Arboretum with any reliable ongoing protection. And it's for that reason that I think it would be disingenuous to conclude that the aim of protecting the Arboretum sets this case apart. Um, simply because the way I see it, I suppose it doesn't actually achieve that. Um, just finally, in, in regard to section 104D, the gateway test, 
Um, so Dimit and I obviously have come to different conclusions with regard to the effects of the proposal, but um, I, I, I think it's important to clarify that uh, the 104D is only a gateway test. Um, if the panel were to come to a, a different conclusion to myself and see that it passes either of those limbs, um, it is then the applicant's job to still uh, satisfy the panel of the matters on the section 104, as well as the, the overall discretion bestowed by 104B. Um, <coughs> I, I think that covers really the points I thought I had to make. Chairman, any questions? Thank you, um, Ollie. Appreciate that. Um, and um, yeah, I think you've helped to clarify your particular um, um, position in the report that you've taken. And it's it's one of those classic cases where. This is not about who's right and who's wrong. It's about um, the, the the relevant arg well, not arguments is the wrong word, but the, the relevant um, interpretation of the, of the district plan provisions to achieve the outcomes that that that, that, that an applicant wants or that the um, the council in this case wants to to keep as well. Um, so appreciate that. Um, what I'll do now, um, Mark Christie, you've been sitting there patiently and heard all of this. Um, it's now your opportunity as a submitter to speak to your submission and we may have some questions for you as well or not. So um, we'll pass over you to Mark and we have in front of us, we do have your um, evidence that has been pre-circulated. So um, feel free to, to, to go through that and point out the, the key or relevant parts you want to make sure that we are mindful of, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just checking, sound checker, you can hear me okay and see me yep. okay. Thank you. Um, I can't see you though. Okay. Video's on at this end, but as long as you can hear me, it's fine. So yep, that's the most important part. Yep. Um, uh, so, firstly, a big thank you for the opportunity to present today, and especially a big thank you to Sue Smith for her help in facilitating this meeting. Uh, just as background, my name is uh, Mark Christie. I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my wife, Catherine. Uh, we live at 87 Patterson Road, which is on the southern boundary of the proposed subdivision. So our house was one of the photos in, in, um, in the uh, McLaren's photos before. We have lived on the site since August 81, so the last uh, nearly two years, uh, but have owned the property since January 2014. And we established uh, a building on the, uh, on the site in, in uh, 2017. Um, Kath and I have previously, as Neil uh, attributed uh, earlier on, have lived in the Cromwell Basin for quite a, a while, from 1989 through to 2007. Um, and during that time, we operated a fairly intensive uh, horticultural operation, growing cut flowers for local and export markets, and also established one of the original uh, olive oil uh, growing areas in central Otago. And we also had a um, established stone fruit operation that that we managed in association with Doug Jones on the on the property. Um, I've also been involved in agriculture and horticulture in New Zealand and Australia for the past 39 years in roles with uh, my employer who pays the bills uh, to keep our lifestyles going. Um, with DuPont and more latterly with an American company called FMC providing technical support and management support for uh, crop protection products in both Australia and New Zealand. Um, I wasn't going to submit or, or ask to be heard at this hearing, but after reading the, um, the report from the CODC planning staff, consent application, I, I felt that there was too many subjective observations um, and would like Therefore, I uh, put my asked if I could um, likewise put some of my own subjective observations in, in place um, that hopefully reflect uh, the, the values that we see locally 
um, around particularly landscape values, the productive use of land in this area, and any reverse sensitivity aspects that, that uh, we see locally. So I'll address those three points specifically. Um, and I've provided some photos which are a long way away and they all tend to uh, flatten the uh, landscape out, but I'll try and talk to those a little bit since you've got them in front of you. Um, as has been detailed in the planners report, which is very comprehensive, it was uh, this particular site is uh, snuggled into a gully on the lower uh, runoff slopes of the Kemmuir Range. Um, it isn't visible from any public location and the photo I've taken uh, from 67, the first photo you can see for, uh, 67 Patterson Road, which is just immediately below us. You can see that even from that relatively close position, you cannot see, will not be able to see any dwelling on this proposed subdivision. And the third photo I've taken from the uh, start of the or entry to the inlet or Kenya inlet. Uh, and you can see that uh, pretty much the subdivision is below or will be below the um, uh, areas that have already been previously developed for uh, either lifestyle blocks such as ourselves or for uh, relatively intensive uh, horticulture operations, predominantly grapes and also stone fruit uh, production. So I'm I'm a little bit confused as to where the adverse effect uh, particularly would be in terms of uh, landscape uh, effect, and I feel this statement is therefore incorrect, and that uh, based on the um, adverse effect on the environment, the effects will be nil to uh, minor, especially relative to uh, visually impacted from the landscape. The only areas that you can see this particular site from or the housing site from are from elevated positions, and you've already seen that from the Kemia, uh, uh, sorry, from the um, Clyde Orchard or Paulin site. And I've also included a photo from uh, higher up on our location, uh, which identifies where you can look down onto the building site. It's relatively elevated. Uh, it doesn't look that steep from the photo, but um, trust me, you get a good old sweat on walking up that hill. From that photo, that's approximately um, uh, 60 meters, 60 to 70 meters above the, actually a little bit higher than that, it'd be close to 80 meters above the location of the building site. Our property, uh, which is slightly above our housing, house property, which is slightly above the building site, is at 220 uh, meters above sea level. The top uh, property, the Cooper's property is at 380 metres above sea level, so quite a, a big uh, uh, lift in, in altitude. Second point I'd like to uh, talk about is productive use of land, and I, I used, I identified um, what Kath and I have done previously quite deliberately to to demonstrate that we have had experience in growing horticultural property. Uh, or small crops before on relatively confined spaces. Um, we have previously, as I said, grown high value uh, intensive perennial uh, crops, uh, notably peonies and lilacs and uh, forsythia, and uh, on a relatively small area and have done that economically um, and have done that well. It's I will point out that, in my opinion, there is quite a, a difference um, in the um, land area or the, or the area that's required for perennial crops versus the annual crops, which I, I agree uh, needs significantly large areas for, for those uh, annual crops to be, for the land to be sustainable on an ongoing basis. Um, I believe that this particular site can be economically productive and certainly sustainable, given the the soil nature and the 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 slope aspect of this 
it is quite um, it is quite different to in fact just over the boundary fence from this particular block on, on the southern slope uh, I've been digging holes this last weekend I can attest that the soil is not of the same quality that it is in the McLaren's property um, I was buggered at the end of digging 25 holes tell me I can tell you that it's it's uh, and less than uh, 30 meters from that particular site. You're also dealing in, in pretty much digging sand. If you're not digging into sand, you're digging into significant rock structures just beneath the surface. And also the slope is uh, 30 degrees and uh, uh, a major part of our particular uh, site. I'll just turn this phone off. Hang on. Um, so uh, as Peter said earlier on, our particular site is, uh, even though we've had experience in growing horticulture in the past, uh, particularly intensive uh, blocks is certainly not uh, suitable for growing um, any horticulture at the moment. Uh, we're also in that particular area that is the flattest uh, relative to and on that boundary is our uh, septic tunnel tank run out area for um, use of the uh, uh, of the um, drainage from the septic tank so you can't grow crops on top of that the other area other thing i would like to uh, address is the reverse sensitivity um, we've actually never noticed the mclaren's growing anything or doing any major activity apart from operating a, a right on lawnmower next door to us so the ideal uh, neighbours from our point of view, they they definitely uh, don't cause any reverse sensitivity from them to us or hopefully us to them. We're also surrounded by four wind machines in relative proximity and uh, have grapes less than, in fact, a great block less than 50 metres from where I'm sitting right now. So we're very aware of reverse sensitivity and the impact of, of uh, of uh, bird scaring, mowing, spraying, harvesting, and all the noises that are attributed to living in a rural environment. I don't think, I can't imagine anything that is going to uh, be, uh, cause uh, reverse sensitivity relative to this block of land. I could also mention Highland Park, but I won't open that uh, can of worms because uh, that creates more noise than just about all those other uh, things put together, to be perfectly honest, especially when there's a slight northerly or westerly blow. Um, so I would contend that any additional noise created due to the subdivision would be nil, and hence the reverse sensitivity would be nil to, to very minor. So in summary, when assessing this application and uh, applying the, the test has been uh, Attested by the um, the planner Ollie, and, and thank you for the uh, very good report you created. I would submit that the adverse effects on the environment and the neighbouring properties will be minor. Um, I would also support the fact that the uniqueness of this small block of land, due to its topography, the the, the niche soils, and the availability of water, um, makes this subdivision very unique on a number of measures. And as immediate neighbours on the southern uh, boundary, Kath and I would definitely continue to support this application and, and ask the, the panel to approve. So thank you for the opportunity to present, Mr Chairman, and I'm very open to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. Um, can I just clarify a couple of things? And again, it's back to the photographs because I want to make sure I'm, I'm, my eyes are seeing what I think I should be seeing. Yeah. Um, your photograph from the elevated location on boundary of 87 Patterson Road, which is your place that on the second page. Um, am I to take it that I'm, I am looking at, at the um, white poles down in the middle of the photograph? That's the um, building platform poles? That is correct, yes. yes. I've what got that, that circle to my thing, but the circle is not on yours. So. Yeah. And the structure to the right of that amongst that tree, is that a shed of some description or something? That's the shed that John talked to that was a the office of the Nevis Fruit Company. It's on oh, blocks and it's removable. Um, yep. Yep. Um, 
and because I'm talking to you, and if you don't answer it, I know Mr. Dimmick will pick this up um, in the questions later. When I look past the Arboretum and the building platforms, that, that piece of land that heads down to the, the, um, the northern boundary, what is, uh, and the driveways are coming, what's planted in there? Is that more trees, isn't it? That's, uh, yeah, it's Clyde Orchard, that's the um, uh, nectarines largely, ah, and right. slightly to the right of that is uh, Cherry Block, and yep. in the distance all the yellow stuff is, uh, is um, uh, grapes. Yep. Cool, that all makes sense, yep, that's what I'm, I'm, I thought that's what I was saying, so thank you for that. Um, otherwise, um, I have no questions for you. Thank you for um, your, your um views as as a neighbor um i think it's been very helpful to hear um how others may view it um from from uh, other than a strict planning um, um perspective so thank you for that it's been very helpful uh stephen you got any questions for mark um, you good, to, good, good to see you again stephen it's been a long time so I, the, even though you can't see me so no my mouse isn't working so it's right again now so i am unmuted no, I'm fine. I understand exactly what you've said. Thank cool. you. Thank you. Uh, um, Martin, are you there somewhere? I am, and no, I'm happy. Thank you. Um, Ollie, have you any questions of um, Mark? No, none from me. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think um, we have heard from um, the applicant and the, and the submitters. Um, there are no other submissions, um, well, there was another submission, but that was in support as well. There's no other submitters to talk to. Um, Mr. Dimmock, it's back to you and your um, and the applicant for the right of reply. Um, so if you're happy to proceed with that now and um, we'll see where we might end up. I'll make one brief written, uh, uh, sorry, verbal um, comment and then I'd like to adjourn the hearing so that we can consider some of these aspects and do our right of reply in reporting, if that's okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Ollie, can I just check on process? Or Mr. Campbell, can I just check pro uh, process? That's that's perfectly acceptable, isn't it? It's not something we've done a lot of. I want to make sure I've got it right. Yes, in terms of adjourning, you can give the applicant um, a period of time to compile a, a right of reply in writing. Yeah, I think that will be helpful in this case. So um, we'll be heading, uh, well, unless anybody disagrees and tells me we shouldn't, we'll, I think we're happy to head down that direction. Stephen, Martin, are you okay in that area? Agree. Yep. Martin? Agree. Um, just a matter of timing, that's all. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll let, let Peter make his quick verbal um, to what his, what his proposal is, and he might, he might have an idea of how long he needs, and that might mean we can answer that question at the same time. So, Peter, back to you. We'll need about two weeks, if that's okay. Is that two weeks? Two weeks, yeah. Yeah. Just one brief comment. Um, I think we all agreed that the proposal to a dwelling site is pretty much totally absorbed into the environment. And one option that we had discussed with our clients was that we could go for a discretionary application to have two dwellings on the one title. I help to achieve part of their aim. Um, but my take on it as well, if it's okay to have two dwellings, what difference does the subdivision make? It's none whatever. I mean, you subdivide what the purpose of the subdivision generally implies in this particular location, dry land site, not a lot of productive use, that there would be a dwelling there. So in actual fact, if the dwelling's acceptable where it is, uh, to have two dwellings on the title, there's no difference in terms of environmental effect from having a subdivision which results in a dwelling or having two dwellings on the one title. And they're both the same planning um, status, discretionary, fully discretionary. Um, so I really can't seem to see what the issue would be uh, in that regard. But that's all I have to say. We will uh, hopefully adjourn the hearing and get back to you um, in writing. Um, perhaps Dylan and John might have something to, to say. It, it doesn't work, does it? Uh, no, the, the extra dwelling on the won't work for us very much, so I don't think that's an option. But uh, we can talk it over with Peter. I think the protection of the, of the uh, arboretum is the big thing. Uh, that's correct. To be a stumbling block at the moment. But having having a subdivision, <laughs> having a subdivision does allow John and I to move into Cromwell if we have to. If John will be 80, 80 later this year, we've got 
in the even lowest bar, they lived to 103. Uh, we still, you cannot predict the future. But by having a separate title for Jenny in that house, it means that, that she could be on that land. We, John would still be able to come out and look after the trees and do whatever he had to, if, if that's the way it's going to work. If we have it all on one title, if we wanted to go into town, the whole lot would have to be sold. And uh, there'd be no house for Jenny and no protection for the, for the plant material. All right? Yeah. No, th thank you for that. Um, I understand um, those issues. And I think um, with where we got to that uh, an adjournment um, with the, the, uh, the, the right of reply in writing um, will be helpful to let you and, and Peter work through those issues um, and also for us to reconvene when we've got them to come to a final decision. So, Peter, does um, Tuesday the 14th of May sound um, OK for that? Indeed it does, yeah. Uh, not 14th, sorry. Um, 20th. 20th. 19. 19. 19. Thanks. Thanks, Sue. <laughs> my calendar my calendar is hidden behind my screen and I can't see it. And I don't want to stand up because you'll see my stomach. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, Mr. Campbell, um, I know you're there. You've got any observations to make from a procedural point of view for us that we need to do? We're okay? No, I think as long as the applicant's happy that the uh, right of reply will be considered um, without the need to reopen the, the hearing, um, unless the panel is of a mind to ask further questions, but that can be decided on the day and then perhaps yep. any questions go back to the um, the parties if need be. But that's once you've, you've seen the right of reply and then you could um, ask the parties to reconvene if you did have any further questions. Yep, that sound okay, Peter? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, cool. Okay, um, so on that basis then, um, I can advise that this hearing is adjourned and subject to the right of reply due with the council by close of business on Tuesday the 19th of May and um, we will then go from there and if, as David says if we need to reconvene we will be in touch um, and I'm sure that, that you have heard both what um, Ollie has said, the questions you've been asked by the panel um, and I'm sure that we'll get a a response that covers all of those issues that we can then use to make our decision. Thank you for everybody for um, their contribution. It's been very interesting and informative. Um, I'm now going to go and have my afternoon tea and I have to confess it's going to be a royal gala apple. Hey, okay. Sonia. Well, I haven't, haven't seen them in the supermarket, to be honest. Well, they're all going overseas. <laughs> Well, fresh choice. Fresh choice have got us. Some. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, thank you, everybody. Um, and yeah, the hearing's adjourned, so we'll leave it at that. Um, Martin and Stephen and David and Sue, if you need to stay on the line, and we'll just make sure procedurally we're all set and we'll go from there. Um, say hello to your wife, Mr. Christie, and we'll catch up one day. Thank you, Neil. And likewise, and uh, all the best. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, everybody. Yep. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, man. <clears throat> That's um, I'm sure Mark will come in and disconnect you, um, John and, and yes, Jill. Yes, he will. He's a good connector and a disconnector. <laughs> it worked very well. Disconnect yeah. See you later. <laughs> See you, Mark. <laughs> All right, just the four of us, I think, is there? Do you need me? Yep. Rebecca's uh, fine. Yeah. Do we need Sue? No, not really. Sorry, Sue. Um, thank you for oh. your efforts today, Sue. Um, no, we, can, we can stop recording. Sorry. Stop recording. Nothing, oh, yeah. Thank so you. We do, need, we do need you, Sue. You've got to stop the recording. <laughs>